there's some sort of veil being lifted on our monetary system where compared to right now, our monetary system is managed by the, either the Federal Reserve or the Central Bank, the United States government. They're trying their best, I'm sure, right? But do they always get it right? No, they don't always get it right. And do they have undue control? And have they over the past you know, 10 to 20 years um, printed money more in favor of like the establishment and the banking system? This is back to the Cantillon, uh, Cantillon effect that we were talking about earlier, where, where this money printing is not going to average citizens in the US, it's going to bankers and people who hold assets. That's why if you wanna play the monetary game in the United States, you can't just hold dollars in a savings account anymore, right? Like you, you're not making any money that way. You have to play the game. You have to buy assets. You have to invest. And so people are saying, well, should a small group of individuals in Washington be able to, uh, to, to, to turn the dials on the money system? What happens if they become corrupt? And so this is a ground up movement to say, no, we want to build our money system. And by the way, not just central banking, but also commercial banking on credibly neutral protocols where, um, you know, the, 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 that can't be biased, that can't be corrupted. Okay, welcome back to the next episode of Yang Speaks and the next episode of our limited series, The Future Of. Folks, today we are talking about something that touches everybody. We are talking about the future of money. Yes, the future of money, and frankly, is the future of cryptocurrency, which is probably our future. We brought on, I've got two people on this podcast. One you all know and love, Carly Riley, who was our finance director on the presidential, but if you listen to this podcast, you know she called Robin Hood blowing up the stock market in our bold predictions for 2021. So she is essentially a, a guru in this and really sees the markets very, very interestingly, in my opinion. Um, so I wanted her perspective. But the the crypto expert we brought on is a guy who I've really got to know and, 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 and like a lot. His name is Ryan Sean Adams. So he's a crypto investor, but he's the creator of the Bankless newsletter and podcast. And what Bankless does it was perfect for me, frankly, in this, but it helps you understand what crypto is and how this whole ecosystem works, but also starts getting you on the path of getting away from your bank and getting into the cryptocurrency world. So if you're like, I think a lot of the Yang Gang, which is crypto curious or crypto fans, but don't really understand it, this is the perfect 101 episode to start and then it gets into more complicated stuff so we're talking about what cryptocurrency is we're talking about how why it's taking off why people are passionate about it how people are using it but then we want to talk about the future of it how it's working how it's going to impact our lives what this means and frankly how important it is for not just white dudes like me to get involved now how we need to get the people it's meant to help if this is going to democratize our economy and our financial system we need people of all frankly, all sorts of backgrounds and make, make a very conscious effort towards um, inclusion in terms of this building process. Because if we don't like our current system, when we rebuild the next one, we have to do it better than the last time or we end up with the same situation. So we talk about that a lot. It's a fascinating episode. I'm pretty confident you guys are gonna like this. So join me, join Ryan, join Carly, talking about the future of money on Yank Speaks. All right, welcome to the next episode, our limited series, The Future Of. And today we are talking about something that touches all of us, the future of money, the future of that cash money, or let's say lack of cash money, um, depending on what we end up, uh, where we end up as a society. And I'm excited today. Um, so I'm joined today by, I'm going to call her our recurring co-host, Carly Riley. Many of you who are 
in the Yang universe and in the Yang gang are familiar with Carly. She was our finance director on the presidential, is now working um, at a venture fund called Kairos. Is we're not gonna call I'm not gonna call you a crypto expert, Carly, by the, any means, but you do know uh, how to raise money and you do understand the finance when you worked at a hedge fund before. So I'm I'm happy to have your perspective. Thanks for joining. And I once made three thousand dollars on Monero. Wow. Not okay. because so I knew Monero. anything about it. I, yeah. That's which, obscure. Well done. It, there it is. And that to love, me. that smooth, <laughs> silky voice you hear next to Carly's is Ryan Sean Adams. Um, we're glad you're here, Ryan. Ryan is a, a crypto investor and the creator of something I found fascinating. Um, it's called Bankless and the Bankless newsletter and podcast. And Ryan can tell you, we'll tell you a lot more about this as we go. But what they are really great at is frankly, lowering the barrier to get people in the crypto game. Now, that's probably not even how he would want to describe it, but that's how the that's idiot um, Zach described it as he as he took the bankless uh, like crash course before. So Ryan, thanks for joining. Welcome to the Future of Money on Yang Speaks. Oh my God, I'm so excited to be here. I think it is about time for Yang Gang and the crypto community to, to unite, to meet. This is a great uh, cross section. It's kind of like a Marvel team up. So I am pumped for this episode, guys. It's fun because um, this is my general sense of the Yang Gang right now. And I don't know, hopefully you guys listening to this where it's like, we're all crypto friendly, I think, where it's where people see cryptocurrency and be like, yeah, new money, <laughs> new, you know, like anti-establishment, like screw the banks, screw Wall Street. This is new. It's interesting. Power of the people. But then the reality is most of us probably don't really know how it works um, or the, the, in, the nitty gritties of it. Maybe read an article or two, maybe even bought some Bitcoin or bought some Ethereum, bought something, but you're maybe kind of a novice in this. And I know certainly I am, that's how I've fit in here. Um, so what I wanted to do, I wanted to take this, I kind of wanted to cover um, three things. One, I wanted to do a, a kind of a basic one-on-one on cryptocurrency and what it is, how it works. Um, so for those of you who've like been talking a big game and maybe don't actually know the ins and outs, like we can dive in. Then I wanted to level set where we are today. And lastly, I want to talk about what this means as a society, like where this looks like in 10, 20 years. Because I think it's been 12 years or so since crypto really kind of started. It's come a long way and it's got a long way to go. So Ryan, why don't we start with that as Carly and I kind of just pick your brain here. Like give us a, a little bit about yourself where you started, but then start to give us this like the basic answer to what the heck is cryptocurrency? How does it work? Yeah, so like, I guess a little bit about me. What I love about crypto is that uh, I'm just a regular guy. So just a regular guy on the crypto journey. Um, you know, I, I started in, in healthcare tech, somewhat like uh, Andrew Yang. Uh, 2014, I discovered Bitcoin, got into crypto that way. And then uh, I just fell down the rabbit hole. And that's how many people in crypto will describe the feeling of, learning about this new money system. It's just falling down the rabbit hole. And I like to say, like many millennials, I was born too early for the internet, but I was born just in time for crypto. And this feels just as big and as impactful as the early internet. So I uh, I found myself sucked into crypto. I quit my corporate job in 2017. Where were you? I what was I was, uh, I was in healthcare tech, so I was at a company called Premier. It's a large uh, hospital yeah. group purchasing organization that had some healthcare informatics stuff. Anyway, so I jumped out, and um, like I like to, I like to say now, uh, I don't work for a company any longer. I work for algorithms. I work for protocols. As weird as that is, but I think more and more of us will find that we work for these crypto money things, these crypto protocols in the future, and we can get into that. So I started Bankless. It's um, a newsletter podcast program in 2019 with my co-host, and we just help people go on what we call, Zach, the, the bankless journey, which is basically, I'm sure we'll get into this, but it's basically uh, using these crypto systems as your banking system rather than traditional banks, rather than JP Morgan or a Wells Fargo, using it in your everyday life. So it's more than just buying crypto and holding it for the long term. It's actually using crypto to go bankless. You talk about like going down this rabbit hole and that being a common journey for folks. Like, what does that look like? Where did that start? Sort of you're starting to discover cryptocurrency or Bitcoin, I imagine, specifically like what is Bitcoin? How do people get sucked in this rabbit hole? And like, what were you learning in that process? Well, so I think it's important to understand like what crypto really is because there's tons of buzz buzzwords, you know, you know, blockchains, like what is that? There's there's Bitcoin, there's Ethereum, there's this thing that you may have heard of called decentralized finance now that's cropping up more and more. So like what are all these buzzwords? Really really to me what crypto is is it's a it's a social movement. 
This is about money by the people for the people because the key thing that it does, the benefit that it provides people and that it provides society is that it allows anyone in the world access to a banking system, anyone in the world. So uh, your geography shouldn't dictate the banking system quality that you have. And crypto eliminates geography. All you need is an internet connection and a keyboard, and you can tap into the best banking system uh, in the world. It's also uh, a system of freedom. So we could get into this, but there are a lot of problems with the uh, you know, central banking and, and uh, how money is printed today. We've, we've seen over the past you know, 10 to 20 years, this, this what we call the Cantillion effect, which is whenever the money printer starts going, it tends to go to the people closest to the money spigot. So it tends to go to the bankers and the wealthy. And we see that in the form of asset inflation. So for the last 10 years, right? Stocks have been on a tear, real estate's been on a tear, but wages, they've been stagnant. Uh, this is because of the Cantillion effect. So this, essentially the movement is a money system by the people, for the, for the people, from the ground up, where everyone has access to a credibly neutral money system. And that term's super important, credibly neutral money system. How does it work? Let's start with that very simple question. I think there's lots of ways to kind of explain how it works, right? But but my favorite way is think about the early internet, right? And so this is a this is a next evolution of the internet. So if you think of the early internet as kind of like the first internet, it's it's really a communication protocol, right? We can create media on it, um, but it, it lacked one thing: it lacked the ability to create digital scarcity. So everything on the internet you can copy and paste, right? So if, um, if there's a, an image or if there's some text or some content, I can copy, paste, I can replicate that. What cryptocurrency does is it, it, is it creates this like unlock for civilization, this unlock for humanity. And that unlock is digital scarcity. So cryptocurrency, unlike the rest of everything else on the internet, cannot be copy and pasted. If I own a Bitcoin, it's mine. You can't, Zach or Carly, you can't just like copy and paste that on a website and make it yours. So in crypto, they call this uh, preventing the, the double spend problem. And that's really the societal achievement, the unlock. In, in 2009, with the Bitcoin white paper and the Bitcoin network, we created this next layer of the internet, next chapter of the internet called digital scarcity. And it turns out that allows us to create really cool things like digital assets. And the first thing we decided to create with Bitcoin was a digital money or a digital store of value. So how crypto uh, achieves this is with cryptography, right? So we, we could talk about that a little bit, uh, plus economics, right? So it makes it very costly to attack the network. And through those two mechanisms, we've created digital scarcity. I have a Bitcoin, it's Zach's, it's got my own cryptography, let's call it fingerprint on it. Um, and then I give it to Carly in exchange for something. Is it still the exact same thing or is it now Carly's with her fingerprint on it and something completely different and my old Bitcoin is disappeared? Help me, because I, 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 like dollars have their own serial numbers on them. So technically you can't copy paste. Like how, did, what, how is that different? It's, it's very similar actually to dollars, right? So the way to think about um, cryptocurrency is that it is a bearer asset. Right. And so what is a bearer asset? Well, in the physical world, a bearer asset would be um, something that you hold and possess. And when you hand it to someone else or give it to someone else, then they hold it and possess it. They're in, now in possession of it. So the most like famous bearer asset that we use in the real world is cash money, cash money. When I give you cash money, Zach or Carly, then I no longer hold that $20 bill that I just gave you. Uh, it's gone from my possession, and then you then hold it, right? Or gold is similar in this way. If I have a nugget of gold or a gold bar and I give it to you, then I no longer own it and you own it, transaction complete, and no one can take it away from us, right? That's the thing. So other forms of digital money, if it's uh, numbers in your Wells Fargo account, right? Wells Fargo, you don't actually own that. Th these are just uh, representations of money on the Wells Fargo mm. like ledger system. You don't act, right. it's not a bare asset. If I buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, I've, I've technically given them money, but realistically that actual cash money is not given to Starbucks by the credit card company for two, three days. Is that like, am I picking up your putting down? Exactly, you're picking it up. Yeah, so the, the key thing is there, there's, no, there's no middleman. 
There's no Visa in the middle of this transaction. There's no Wells Fargo Bank. As if we're handing something to each other. It's just the same. It's like actual physical possession has just been uh, transmitted from me to you, only it's happened digitally. That's what digital scarcity gives us, right? New sponsor alert. This episode of Yank Speaks is brought to you by Calm. So if you're quarantining in COVID right now, your routine has been completely disrupted. And for me, when I'm off my routine, I don't wind down the right way. And so when I'm on my phone, I'm scrolling. That stuff like gives you endorphins and it's tougher to fall asleep. And what I love about Calm is that it helps you calm down and relax. So we're excited to partner with Calm, which is an app designed to help you ease stress and get the best sleep of your life. And when you relieve anxiety and improve your sleep, you feel better in every part of your life. And what's great about it, you can be scrolling through your phone, and you're like, oh wait, I need to go to sleep, I need to calm down and pop open the Calm app. It's got a whole library of programs designed for healthy sleep, like soundscapes and meditations and 100 sleep stories narrated by beautiful, soothing voices, like Kelly Rowland just whispering sweet nothings in your ear as you fall asleep. So for listening to the show, we're offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash yank. 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library with new content added every week. So get started today, calm.com slash yang. That's calm.com slash yang. I think a lot of people know that blockchain is somehow connected to cryptocurrency and to, to Bitcoin. Can you explain that role in, in this? <laughs> And, and how that impacts these transac transactions. Bitcoin is, is essentially a blockchain. That's kind of the technology. That's the database technology. Um, a number of years ago, especially like tw 2015, it was sort of uh, all the trend to talk about, well, um, blockchains are going to be important, but not B Bitcoin, right? So blockchain, not Bitcoin. To me, this kind of reminds me of sort of the, the early internet because um, like the idea in the early internet was all of these companies would have their own private intranets, right? Just a corporate wide intranet, like a, a SharePoint or something like that. Um, but, but what really ended up happening is, is some of that happened and those are like private blockchains, but the true value for society, the big unlock happened on the public internet, right? When we could combine all of these other intranets that various companies had and pull them in, into one communication protocol so we could all transmit that. So um, the, the, the blockchain, not Bitcoin movement kind of faded away a little bit because what turned out to be the most important was the, the public blockchains themselves, the Bitcoins, the Ethereum. These are the things that are open and permissionless just like the internet. So uh, I guess all this to say, Blockchains are part of the database technology that Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are based on. Um, but the, the cool thing about blockchains is that they are public and permissionless. And private blockchains that you know a company uh, creates or a bank creates might tap into those public blockchains, but are as important to the story of this whole like new money, future of money system that we've created here. I've always thought of blockchain as like this ledger that keeps the record of the Bitcoin transactions. Yes. Is that correct on a, a basic, basic level? That is correct, right? So, so Bitcoin is an asset, but it's also a network, right? So if I were to give you Bitcoin, Carly, then that transaction gets recorded on this network, this, this ledger, this general ledger, and that is the blockchain. But it's a public blockchain that's accessible to everyone. So there is Bitcoin, the asset, and there's Bitcoin, the, the network, the blockchain, and these two are, are sort of separate ideas. The best analogy someone said to, to explain it to me was, blockchain is the engine. So like, if you look at like, if you, like a car, like, you have an engine in a plane, you have an engine in a helicopter, you have an engine in a, in a car, you have a, like the, the, mo the motor engine, whatever, like the, the combustible engine, let's say as the, the example. But cryptocurrency or Bitcoin is the Model T Ford that actually changed the world that applied to humans was usable. And that the engine, that blockchain is gonna be applied to a whole bunch of different things in different ways. And maybe those innovations will also change the world. But right now it's the Model T Ford. We're making people go, get, get them, go wherever it is. Is that, Accurate? How'd I do? 
Yeah, I think that's accurate. I would I would say that, right? So like blockchain is just a uh, is just a technology to enforce digital scarcity. The cool thing about something like like a Bitcoin is that um, there's social consensus that this Bitcoin blockchain is creating this new form of money, and everyone is buying into that idea of Bitcoin as a as a new form of money. But but there's other things you can do with blockchain too. So like there's uh, there's Bitcoin and then but there's also Ethereum, which takes the idea of Bitcoin and makes uh, the, the money system a bit more programmable. I've heard if you're following this casually, a lot of people heard of Bitcoin. Some have heard of Ethereum. Carly mentioned Monero. I've heard of a billion others. Dogecoin is whatever Elon Musk is pumping right now. Um, <laughs> Dennis Rodman had a like a pot coin or whatever the hell like back in the day. Um, Explain, uh, like breaking out all of them is gonna be too hard, but maybe let's start with Bitcoin and Ethereum, like the differences, and then maybe how they vary, you know, like what when people, are, like when they create a new one, is it just like a fancy new name or uh, what is the mechanics of that? The, the thing to understand about all of these different forms of, of, of money and cryptocurrencies uh, is that they all have something in common. Um, and that's that they're based on credibly neutral protocols. And this term protocols throws people off because crypto people use it all the time. But all a protocol is, is it's a set of rules, okay? A set of rules. So if you think about the importance of protocols, which we, which we often don't, but protocols are at the very base layer of society, right? So the US constitution, what is that? That is a protocol for how to run a republic. Super important 4,000 page document. It spells out, this is how we're going to run this republic called the United States. And what were we able to accomplish with that protocol? Well, we were able to replace the kings in England with like the people, with protocols. We took, instead of the, the, the king's duties, we, we created a constitution so we could give it back to the people. That's what these uh, crypto systems are doing. I, I mentioned this term credibly neutral because the great thing about the US constitution is that uh, it's neutral, right? We, we've got sort of this balance of powers idea. So uh, the concept that one individual or dictator uh, or you know, totalitarian regime can't like assume power in the co that's that's really important because that makes it neutral. So you want a system that's unbiasable that one party can't centralize and control. And, and the other piece is is uh, credible. So the U.S. Constitution works because we all believe that the U.S. Constitution works. Ryan, you're getting into our world here. I think we'd say it's theoretically neutral, um, but I'm with you. Obviously imperfect, right? But but credibly neutral for organizing society. Okay, so um, Bitcoin and Ethereum bring that concept to, to money. So Bitcoin says, well, wh what if we were to create a credibly neutral monetary system? That means no one can change the rules in terms of how much Bitcoin that should exist, right? It's it's like impossible to change the rules. It's immutable, uh, and uh, it's anyone can audit it. Anyone can access it, right? That's what Bitcoin is. It, it simply, it's all it is. It's a credibly neutral protocol for money. Specifically, there shall be only twenty one million Bitcoin that exist, right? That's what it says. It's like a digital gold standard in many ways, right? Yes, yes. That's exactly that's exactly what it is. When you say it says, that's what it says. Who said it? Well, this is a great thing. So like, uh, you know how the constitution, it's written in a, in a document, right? Almost right. In, in legal prose, essentially. Right. Um, well, Bitcoin's credibly neutral protocol for money is written in code. So you actually like audit the code. You know how if you, if you have a browser, there's a button you can click view source and you see like all the, all the stuff that actually creates the images on your screen in your web browser. You could do that with a money system. That's what Bitcoin does. You can view source, anyone can see it. You could see the issuance rate of Bitcoin when it trails off and that's what makes it credibly neutral. And now it credibly because uh, there's a social element to this movement too. You ask like, what's the difference between Bitcoin and, and uh, Dogecoin? Well, the difference is um, there, there are more people who believe Bitcoin is a money than Dogecoin. It is more credibly neutral. So that's how movements kind of build from the ground up. Um, I think the other part of this story is you asked about Ethereum. So Ethereum then takes Bitcoin, right? This idea of digital scarcity and says, well, what if we could, what if we generalize that? What if instead of just creating one type of money, a Bitcoin, what if we could create all sorts of these digital assets? What if we could create stocks? What if we could create bonds? What if we could create an entire uh, credibly neutral banking system 
on top of this cryptocurrency thing. And those two tools together, Bitcoin and Ethereum, are really the tools that uh, that I and communities like mine are using to go bankless because um, we, we have these, these new technologies and these new tools now to do that. This episode of Yang Speaks is brought to you by your favorite Hello Tushy, the coolest bidet company on the planet. This is frankly the future of toileting. They figured it out in Europe. It's time for us to figure it out here. It's a joke because they've been using bidets for centuries, but they've always been expensive, costing thousands of dollars. And now the new brand new Hello Tushy 3.0 is here to level that playing field. It's stylish, eco-friendly, easy to install and affordable, which is pretty cool. It attaches right to your existing toilet, no electricity or additional plumbing, and it cuts toilet paper use by 80%, which is great. We love saving money. We love helping the environment, less paper, less money. All things are great. You've got a 60-day try-it risk-free guarantee and a 12-month warranty. And these new ones essentially clean themselves. So it's pretty freaking cool. So here's how you do it. Go to hellotushy.com slash yang. Get 10% off because you're listening to this podcast. Plus, you get free shipping. It's a special offer just for Yang Speaks listeners. So go to hellotushy.com slash yang for 10% off. Hellotushy.com slash yang. There's some sort of veil being lifted on our monetary system where compared to right now, our monetary system is managed by the, either the Federal Reserve or the central bank, the United States government, which is essentially the, the standard of the world. Um, is it because, are people interested in this because this is democratizing the money and sharing it like both transparently and theoretically, eventually equally around the world? Is that the driver here? Or is it really like a, the other piece is like anti-establishment, the world is ending, the dollar is going to fail, middle finger to the world, buy Bitcoin to the moon. I think it's a combination of those things. And for everyone who enters, it's it's uh, a little bit different. But I do think that this is a, a populist movement in some ways, but it's a healthy form of populism because it's not saying we're going to burn down the old system. It's that it's saying we're going to opt out. We're going to build this new awesome system. And this new system, this new money system, this new financial system is going to be based on credibly neutral protocols, right? So if you think about the, the, the monetary policy of the U.S., um, and when individuals think about that, well, w- what is that controlled by? It's co- controlled by Jerome Powell and a small group of individuals, right? And they're trying their best, I'm sure, right? But do they always get it right? No, they don't always get it right. And do they have undue control? And have they, over the past you know, 10 to 20 years, um, printed money more in favor of like the establishment and the banking system, this is back to the Cantillon, uh, Cantillion effect that we were talking about earlier, where, where this money printing is not going to average citizens in the US, it's going to bankers and people who hold assets. That's why if you wanna play the monetary game in the United States, you can't just hold dollars in a savings account anymore, right? Like you, you're not making any money that way. You have to p- play the game. You have to buy assets, you have to invest. And so people are saying, well, should a small group of individuals in Washington be able to, uh, to, to, to turn the dials on the money system? What happens if they become corrupt? And so this is a ground up movement to say, no, we want to build our money system. And by the way, not just central banking, but also commercial banking on credibly neutral protocols where um, you know, the, 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 that can't be biased, that can't be corrupted. Uh, and so this is this is kind of a reaction to some of the the wealth inequality that we've seen. This is a, a reaction to censorship. This is a reaction to um, you know hedge fund managers calling the the owners of Robinhood and saying stop trading GameStop. Right? It's a reaction to all of these things. And this is crypto's moment. This is crypto's decade. I think this is why this is an important movement for us. Let me ask though, because I I totally understand the dynamic of like the kind of establishment has been rigging the system and making the rules and setting the rules for far too long and therefore sort of the only people who have been benefiting from the rules. But there is a movement really on the left in the United States, this like almost modern monetary theory camp that says, look, if we can kind of print money 
<laughs> limitlessly, right? We could in theory print money and give it directly to people, right? And, and like print money for, for a UBI or something like that. What concerns me about when we look at the future of Bitcoin and, and these sort of um, limited currencies is, is sort of what the issue was maybe with the gold standard, which is there is a finite amount of it. And are we going to end up in a world where once again, you have a finite resource and it's all pooling to elites and there's no more that can be created? How do you respond to that? Or, or what, are, what are people thinking about that? So I think that is a really insightful comment, Carly. Like, I think you hit the nail on the head. And there, there, is, um, there are different com like camps and communities inside of, of cryptocurrency. So there's this strong Austrian you know, economic uh, bent that would hate everything that you just said about modern monetary theory. Right? I, I like, may be in that camp for what it's worth. I don't okay, know. <laughs> well, so like th there's that camp and they say like, no, government shouldn't print money, right? We should we should have a credibly neutral standard, something like a gold standard, right? And, and that should come from from cryptocurrency. Um, but to your point, well, what what's, what's the response when you say, well, that's just going to lead to an unequal system in the future where people who bought in Bitcoin early or whatever, crypto early, like they end up being the, the elites and the new bankers, right? So that's one group in crypto. But there's another group in crypto because it's a very you know wide camp that thinks that, well, we, we have been uh, printing money and essentially we've, we've been giving out UBI. We've been giving out UBI for the last like 20 years but we've we've been giving it to the wealthy right so so maybe what we need is a ubi system um for for um everyone else the citizens right this is kind of andrew yang's platform and well with, with cryptocurrency with with uh systems like ethereum this makes a a, a great path for distributing that money right so like i i don't know but, but getting a check from the irs or whoever issued it that you know for for um uh, covid you know, stimulus, basically, that was a very long process. What if you could just hit a button and a digital currency from issued by the central banks in the US just appeared in your wallet, right? So like, so like, this is the type of innovation we could tap into. And there's a whole side of the crypto community that's like, hey, you know, uh, we don't think that bottom up money, like a Bitcoin or an Ether should be outlawed, right? We think that people should have that option. But we also think that that central banks should play a role in this and they should promote better distribution of their money through things like UBI and cryptocurrency can be uh, and you know can be sort of a conduit and a network to make that more efficient. Um, so you'll find both both sides of the camp uh, it, represented in the in the crypto community. I think. I believe it's Bitcoin in particular. They have done some work on regulation. They have been working with governments to prevent the money laundering piece of this because the the down the dark side of cryptocurrency is that if it's completely anonymous really like you can't follow the money anymore and you end up in some really 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 dark places um so talk to me a bit about where we are today on let's call it the regulation of this or not even regulation like how governments have been working with the cryptocurrency community or not working with them or not working yeah, <laughs> yeah. or are afraid the of them <laughs> So that so the crypto community, the internet community has uh, has always talked about government as kind of the final boss, right? It's like you pop its head up and shut it <laughs> I down. I love the internet right? so like, much. <laughs> so um, that's been an ongoing meme, and I, I I would just say that that's been an ongoing meme since since kind of the birth of of Bitcoin. But um, what I would say is the, the the regulatory regime in the U.S. and in most countries around the world has actually been surprisingly friendly to crypto, um, which is which is which is great. Uh, so. You know, the banks are now, bank charters can now custody crypto assets in the U.S. Uh, the commodities, the CFTC, the Commodities Future Exchange, has just said that Bitcoin is a, a commodity, so it can be regulated that way. And so is Ether, a commodity. Um, there's been no move to really outlaw cryptocurrencies. And I think par par part of the reason for this, and, and by the way, on the comment about sort of uh, you know, anonymous cash and, and the hazards of that. Well, I mean, the, the biggest anonymous cash and money laundering actually happens with like dollars, right? It's actually, <laughs> if you want to launder, point. if you want to launder money, cash is easier. Yeah, it's right. way easier. Like there's fiat on ramps to crypto. It, it's, it's open, but it's not completely private in, in Bitcoin or in Ethereum. So if you want to launder money, like don't do this guys, but like, Cash is the way to do it. Benjamins, that's where briefcases full I've of Benjamins. I've seen Breaking Bad. I know what you're talking. I'm just you know what? I'm, yeah. So, so, yeah. um, 
So anyway, it's it's actually not a good tool for laundering money. And I think what's what's happening is governments are realizing that there are far more wins uh, than than losses with the adoption of crypto. There, there's going to be a whole new kind of where's the crypto Silicon Valley going to be located? Is that going to be in the jurisdiction of the U.S. or is it going to be another country? Are we going to like what about uh, distribution of central bank digital currencies? Well, those should happen on public networks like like Ethereum. So there are all of these efficiency wins that governments have similar to the early internet. Like the early internet, it's it's a little bit scary to say, we've got this communication protocol, anyone in the world can spin up a website and you know start projecting whatever ideas they have. That's a little bit scary for governments, right? But the wins uh, in adopting that protocol, the protocol of the internet, far outweighed the losses. And so everybody did it. And I think that's that's what's happening with governments around the world is, is they're all adopting this technology for the wins. I'm so excited to watch prime ministers and global leaders talk about Dogecoin or whatever <laughs> dreams we whip up. Um, it's gonna be exciting. And I, I believe if you do not understand this, you're unfit to lead because this same community just wiped out Wall Street for about a week. Um, like this is real and it's frustrating to watch leaders pretend they don't understand it or think it's like a weird internet culture thing. On the other hand, is there a certain advantage? Again, I worry about these kinds of technologies ultimately being co-opted by sort of these elite institutions and Ooh. undermining the very sort of advantages they provide, which is this like democratization effect, right? And so is there a certain advantage that, call it the internet right now, has in that a lot of leaders don't necessarily fully understand this. And it kind of gives us an opportunity to make sure it sort of is implemented democratically, you know, before, you know, before sort of these call them elite institutions or establishment institutions are able to really kind of co-opt them and manipulate them to their own gains. Totally. I think the birth story, like we, we talked about cryptos, it almost had an immaculate conception because all along the establishment has, has, has shunned it. Right, it's just like oh, it's too volatile to be a money, right? Uh, like the the boom and bust cycles. Like uh, of course, every time they said this is like a, you know, a, a, a tulips kind of like fad, and it's all going to 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 fade out. Every single cycle, they said this, and so uh, what what's happened is people have been the first to adopt it. Developers, internet natives have been the first to adopt it. I think it would be far less interesting if in like year one of Bitcoin, the U.S. government just bought all the Bitcoin, right? And that's not going to distribute cryptocurrency to the people. The, the other thing I'll, I'll say to you is like one concern I have being in, in cryptocurrency is back to exactly what you said, Carly, which is like we have to make sure that we're not cr just creating a new crypto system with like Bitcoin as the gold standard and we get a new set of bankers, but they're still bankers, right? This is why Ethereum is so important. This is why this idea of decentralized finance is important because Bitcoin just gives you sort of a money, but that that money is often custodied in this new set of banks called crypto banks. These are the Coinbase's and Gemini's of the world. With Ethereum, what, what you get is the ability to actually do the banking yourself in a self-sovereign way. It creates like banks as, proto as protocols on top of it. So that's sort of, we can get into what it means to, to go bankless, but that's sort of what, what we're talking about. Going bankless means actually replacing the banks wholesale, not creating a new set of banks, replacing the banks with these credibly neutral protocols. And this is the idea of open finance or decentralized finance, if you've heard those terms. This episode of Yank Speaks is brought to you by Literati Kids. If you like reading and you think children should read, this is a product for you. So great children's books opens up new worlds for discovery. With Literati Kids, your child can explore uncharted places every month with incredible stories handpicked by experts. So Literati Kids is a try before you buy subscription book club. Each month, Literati delivers five vibrantly illustrated children's books, bringing the immersive magic of reading right to your home. And they've got age-based book clubs that ensure appropriate reads. So for story time, 
of letting them read on their own. I personally grew up loving Choose Your Own Adventure books. I also loved the Berenstein Bears. Freaking loved them. So you can get all this awesomeness brought to your children with a cool monthly subscription through Literati Kids. So head to literati.com slash yang for 25% off your first two orders. It's pretty awesome. 25% off books. Select your child's book club and start them on a literary journey like no other. Literati.com slash yang. It's the only place you can find 25% off your first two orders. And this one-of-a-kind book subscription is the most joyful way to foster a lifelong love of learning for kids. So literati.com slash yang. So let's let's dive into this talking about what this starts to look like in practice for people. Because it's fun to say we're getting rid of banks. It's fun to say yes. we've got crypto, we got this new currency, <laughs> like the dollar is not what it is to be. It's fun to say bow to the people, right? But what what does this mean? So there's there's four categories I want to dive into in some capacity, and we'll figure out which more which more interesting. I want to talk about regular transactions. I want to talk about personal like accounting and checking savings, that sort of thing. I want to talk about the investment piece. We're talking about assets and the banking and stock market. And then the lastly is like the government oversight, central banking, Federal Reserve, like how this all intertwines. Um, so let's start with the first one. Um, basic transactions. Like what does it look like I'm a human being? And maybe that's kind of combined with the personal checking and savings too. But start with like, I'm going to go buy Starbucks. 10 years from now, and we're all using Bitcoin or Ethereum, whatever it is, what, yeah. what can that look like? Yeah, so uh, what's so cool about this is uh, we are totally early, right? So, so I don't know if you guys remember the early 90s and the internet sucked and it was like, you know, dial up and it was only for geeks and it was just a very small community, right? Hey, 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 I use AOL. And, uh, <laughs> you remember the AIM days. I was days. good at the You Got Mail situation. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you remember if, if mom picked up the phone, basically. Yeah, mom, your you blew swiped. it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm like dating myself. I'm 33. Those of you, I know probably younger, some of you, old, some of you older, hope you feel in pain. Anyway, keep going. Uh, okay, so like the youngsters might not remember, but you and I remember these days, Zach. And yes. the, the internet was, was pretty clunky. It was hard to use. That's where we are right now. So, so basically population who owns cryptocurrency right now is probably about like 60 to 80 million, but they just do one thing with it. They hold. People or globally? Yeah, globally. Okay. Uh, but they just do one thing with it, hold. Okay. So like what, what we're doing in kind of bankless is doing more than hold. And I think of what you just said is like checking accounts and investing accounts and um, you know, p payment accounts, all of these things. These are like the money verbs that we do, right? So think of what's, what's a money verb. Hold is one verb. You can like store your wealth and hold it, but pay is another verb and lend is another verb and trade is another verb, right? And what is banking? It's all of these money verbs put together, right? Like that's what banking is. And so back to this idea of people need banking, but we don't necessarily need banks, right? That That's the idea. So what, what, what can you do right now? Um, let's talk about that first, I guess, money verb, that sort of the, the pay money verb. And this has been kind of the holy grail for, for crypto. When am I going to be able to buy my Starbucks with, uh, with Bitcoin? Well, it turns out that uh, Bitcoin or Ether for that matter, which is the cryptocurrency of Ethereum, these are not good assets to spend with. And do you know why? It's because Bitcoin pizza guy, somebody spent a uh, first Bitcoin transaction in like, it was like 2012 or something, uh, and he bought a pizza with it, okay? And uh, so spent Bitcoin on pizza, and the cost of that transaction in today's terms is like tens of millions of dollars. Because the thing that you want to do with Bitcoin is hold it because it appreciates in value. It's a scarce asset. It's not stable like the US dollar. So the way it's crypto- It's like doing business in gold. Exactly. It's just like, it's something you want to store and hold. It's not something that you want to pay your regular transactions with. So, but what cryptocurrency over the last three years has done is created a less volatile form of cryptocurrency called a stable coin or a crypto dollar. So this is a cryptocurrency that just tracks the US dollar. Some of these are, are trustless. Some of these are trusted, issued by banks. We could get into that later. But now what you can do is uh, I actually have a Visa card where I can go into Starbucks and I can swipe that Visa card and I'm actually paying with crypto through the Visa network connected to a bridge to, to crypto and I'm paying with uh, stable coins, with uh, crypto dollars essentially. But essentially dollars, right? It's, tra it's not Bitcoin. Well, yeah. so it's some of it is and some of it isn't. So some of it is like dollars. So there's a there's it's on cryptocurrency, the network, it's on the blockchain, but it's like mapped to a bank somewhere. But some of it is actually backed by uh, an asset like Ether, 
So it's like, do you, you know, in the old days where, where like long time ago when the US dollar was backed by gold, um, some of it's some of it's like that, right? So some of it is dollars that are backed by ether. Anyway, cryptocurrency has solved that problem. So we have a way to pay with our cryptocurrency using stable coins. And there's now something like 30 to 50 billion dollars worth of crypto stable coins out there now. And this has grown like 50 fold, 100 fold over the last 18 months, like just a massive amount of growth. Which sounds like a healthy hybrid between using Bitcoin purely or using Ethereum or whatever it is, but crypto purely and using a dollar, which is exactly. probably the bridge you want to get started, right? In exactly. Awkward time. So it's, and it's something that didn't exist. So the volatility problem, uh, it didn't exist like in the early days of Bitcoin and it does now. What steps need to happen to like, get past this interim stage where you're still using a Visa card to pay for it? Like how far down the road? And is there a world where we're all kind of using Bitcoin down the road or a dollar version using a Bitcoin in Starbucks? And what does that look like? I think that uh, payment, like in that way that you're talking about, might actually be uh, like last mile. That might actually be the final thing that crypto solves, right? So right now, if, if you're kind of geeky, if you're like me, you can open up uh, an Ether account, right? An Ethereum account. And I could pay you with stable coins without going through the Visa network if you have uh, an Ethereum account. So I could just say, here's some dollars, and I'm gonna pay you, Zach, you know, $10 worth of stable coins, and there's no transaction in the middle. But to upgrade the world's proof, like um, uh, systems, so that Starbucks, that, that's gonna take some time to upgrade those systems. So there's the capability now, but to upgrade all of that infrastructure will, will take some time. But there are some other things that you can do in crypto now. I would argue that are far better than you can do in the traditional system. So you mentioned another thing, which is checking and savings accounts. That's like way better in crypto, even today, like right now. Because um, it grows? Well, so, I mean, I don't know if you guys have checked your your, your bank uh, checking account or savings account at the interest rate, right? But it's like 0.01%. It's, 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 it's really sad. Nuts. It's really sad. Um, mm -hmm. In crypto, you can open up savings accounts and checking accounts, again, using your... Uh, Ethereum address as sort of your bank account. And Ethereum address is like a bank account. Uh, and you can get far better interest rates. Like I'm talking like 8%, I'm talking God, 10%. That's amazing. And this is based, this is on crypto dollars. Does it have the same downside risk though? Because that's one of the fears that you buy Bitcoin, you're like, oh, you know, it's gonna be, it could go to zero tomorrow and it could go back up to just 40 grand, whatever it is right now. Um, that's what's cool. Because of uh, you have stable coins, I could actually like, just use these stable coins and be earning a six, seven, eight percent, ten percent interest rate in the crypto system, and I can't get that anywhere in the traditional financial system bank account today, right? So, like, this is a—it's like working in crypto can be like working in a uh, a banking system with superpowers, right? Like, this is it. If you learn, this is the. Um, it's a pain and it's hard and user experience isn't there, but there's also a lot of upside in being on the bleeding edge in the frontier and you can't get these types of interest rates anywhere else, right? If someone wanted to, to do that right now, let's say that person is Zach and Carly, because um, we're nodding and smiling here. Um, how does one do that? And if it's a link, I'm going to put it in the episode description um, for the world. How does yeah. how do you do this? Well, so the first step is you actually have to own some cryptocurrency, right? So, okay. so you have um, the money up. How much right, that cost? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it depends how much you want to buy. How much you want to buy, right? So, let's say I'm cheap. Do, let's say I want to put a couple grand in. Is that too little? Do I have to have what's like the minimum? No way. You size? could put a hundred dollars. You could a thousand dollars. Okay, really? Whatever you okay. want. Yeah, you get started with ten dollars. With you know twenty dollars. Wow. Okay. Hundred. Cool. So, um, there's like these two financial systems right now. There's the old. We call it old fi, <laughs> like the old financial system on the other side. And then there's this new decentralized financial system. And the bridge between those things is what's known as a crypto exchange. So there are lots of crypto exchanges. Um, Gemini is one, uh, Coinbase is another if you're if you're in the US. And so what you do is you, you create a an account on the crypto exchange, and then you take some of your dollars from your US bank account and you ACH transfer it to a Coinbase or a Gemini. Uh, and then you buy some crypto. You don't have to buy Bitcoin or Ether. You can, if you want to speculate on the upside of those assets, you could just buy crypto dollars. So you could buy something called USDC, which is a crypto dollar. Then you could take that crypto dollar and you can move it from Coinbase into a, an Ethereum address and start getting into this, this bankless money system and start you know parking it into a decentralized finance interest account, for instance. So 
like to do this in ter in terms of level of sophistication, like it's probably about an hour of time. Uh, and I don't know, like I, I think basically anyone can 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 do this at this point. It takes just a little bit of it's it's dial up modem days, so it just takes a little bit of finesse and. It's a little more troublesome than than it will be in the future, but the user experience is getting better. What is there like a resource for folks can like go and, and maybe read this six or thirty times to, to understand exactly what that all means? Is there like a good place that folks can kind of like learn a little bit more about getting started on this journey? Yeah, we try to do that with Bankless. So we have like a guide of like if if you're going from zero to uh, to crypto. Um, you can do these these steps, and this is how you go from like your bank account to a crypto bank account to decentralized finance. What's your website? It's newsletter.banklesshq.com, and you want to go to the guide. So we have a, it's called the guide one. I'm gonna paste this link when this episode drops. This episode of Yank Speaks is brought to you by Athletic Greens, the most comprehensive daily nutritional beverage you are going to find. Here's the deal. You get some Athletic Greens, comes in little pouches or like a little bowl of powder, however you want to do it. Dump it into some water, mix it up, drink it, and it tastes great. When I was with my sister, she put it in a smoothie for me. It's amazing too, but you don't need it. It tastes good, and it's this all-in-one superfood powder, by far the easiest, most delicious nutritional habit you can add to your health routine today. Helps your gut. It has 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients. It's got all that good stuff that you get when you eat veggies. Pretty cool, easy to use, and because of this podcast, you can get a discount on Athletic Greens and some free vitamin D. So what's that discount? You get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit our link today. So whether you're looking for better performance or better health, Athletic Greens makes it easy. So visit athleticgreens.com, join health experts, athletes, and health conscious go-getters around the world, make a daily commitment to health every day. That's athleticgreens.com slash yank and get your free supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. Are there organizations or people that are working on making sure that that these resources really are available to maybe communities today that lack an access to credit in our traditional systems, right? Like plugging this gap um, that that very much exists in the financial system today for those, you know, I think of women and communities of color and and people who have often been been more on the outskirts of the traditional system. I think the answer to that question is not yet. So mm -hmm. right now, this is skewed towards the geeks, basically. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is, if you're a geek in Argentina or, Argentina or Venezuela, and um, you can't get access to a banking system because you're literally shut out, there's capital controls, right? Um, then you can use this crypto banking system. So that's access from an international perspective. Like you know, I know people using stable coins in Argentina to to escape sort of the 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 inflation traps there. Uh, and also to like, I mean, uh, to actually use their money. Um, so from that perspective, yes, but it's still skewed a little bit towards towards the geeks right now. Um, but this is again, you know, uh, 1983, first cell phone comes up. It's a brick and it costs four thousand dollars, right? That's how technology works. It it starts there and then it gradually, as it improves, becomes more and more accessible. And I think that's what we'll see with with crypto, and it will start to reach these underserved communities. Uh, in ways that the banking system hasn't, whether that's international or in the U.S. Interesting. Well, that that strikes me as an opportunity for folks who are listening who understand cryptocurrency. I feel like figuring out a way to start bridging some of those those gaps in places where it doesn't exist. Uh, hit me up if you're interested in that. I'm interested in that. <laughs> Let me ask you this, um, and this is a question our producer suggested me, which is a good one. Um, so Soraya is our producer. She's always behind the scenes. And for those of you who want to know what makes the Yang Speak podcast worth, it's all Soraya. Um, but the, our question is really good is that this new crypto space is all, it's all online, right? It's not the gold backed or there's no physical dollars. There's no technical physical cash like what happens if let's call it catastrophe strikes like electricity outage or um i know there's a lot of this stuff can't be hacked but maybe it can be wiped right like I, like if the data disappears um th th some of those risks still exist with the dollar but definitely more so here because there's no real physical asset have there been discussions on 
the impact of this, uh, if or the risk of this, given that it's all in zeros and ones on you know powered by electricity. I think that cryptocurrency, the 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 sophisticated networks, the hardened networks like a Bitcoin and Ethereum are are really designed to work if the internet works, if the internet is up, right? So that that has some dependencies, as we know. The internet has to be up. Uh, electricity has to be on. If those if those things are not functional, um, then definitely probably humanity has some big problems going on, and like we might be in a place where we're reverting back to things like like gold in the physical world. Um, so yes, there are some dependencies, but the dependency is is kind of like that the internet stays on. You'd have the same problem with the dollar system, I imagine. If we yeah, we'd have a lot well, of it's problems. It's more like the data if... tracking, right? If it all blew up, like would this like at least with the dollar, like the banks have still are using paper records to keep their, you know, um, I don't know if you ever watched Mr. Robot, um, but they, it's a movie about hackers and they literally hack the world's financial system, but they had backed it up physically. So after hell for like three months, the banks and the large corporations were able to like level reset everybody where they were wealth wise. Um, is that even an option in, in like a crypto, like, I don't, like, you know, I don't understand the technology enough to know that if everything got hacked, like, would it all just go to zero or would you be able to reset? You can definitely reset. So if there was some sort of issue with a Bitcoin or an Ethereum and let's say um, Bitcoin did the thing it's never supposed to do. And suddenly someone found a vulnerability to print, you know, a million extra Bitcoin, and give it to themselves. Right. Well, what would happen in that case is the community would no longer accept that Bitcoin. They would say that's a the wrong Bitcoin. And then the fake Bitcoin, everybody socially, that, that's what backs all of these systems, like we, the protocol of the constitution. It's still people at the very bottom. So it's enforced by like the constitution, which is like legal script in a document. And the same way Bitcoin or an Ethereum is enforced by code, but there's still a social system. There's still people as the, the bottom layer of it. We call that like the layer zero. So what would happen is they would just move to the real Bitcoin rather than uh, letting the hack kind of spoil it. And I think in, in a lot of ways, um, crypto systems are more resilient to attack. So if you think about a, an authoritarian country that maybe decides that if you're a political dissident, uh, you no longer have access, like your social credit score is diminished, you no longer have access to the banking system, we're gonna shut you out. Well, no one can shut you out of your Ethereum address. Like no one can, it's impossible. As long as you have a keyboard, your private key, access to the internet, it's uncensorable. No one can shut it down. No one can take it away from you. So it's more resilient uh, to to those types of threats. I to think, humanity. which is humanity which is flaws. important for us, right. right? There are some like tragic stories, right, of folks who have like millions of dollars now in Bitcoin yeah. and they like can't remember their key and yes. they like, can't and they literally oh, have like they're like multimillionaires and they just don't have access to it. And there's and no way just, to get it because of the way this works. Yeah, it, that's my understanding. Is that we right? We should Ryan? probably solve for that. I don't know how. We, we talk about this as it's like going on the Oregon Trail, like heading west, right? Like it's dangerous. This is definitely the frontier, right? So if you screw up, you can lose stuff at this stage. It's getting better, but um, like still keep keep those things in mind um, because what, what you're talking about, Carly, absolutely does happen. If you lose your private keys, just like if you lost cash or if you lost gold, it's gone. Like it's gone. So uh, it's not for the faint of heart. When you're thinking about crypto, I think the average person is like, whoa, new money, new currency. Like this is no, like, come on, like the current system is working enough. Like, what are you trying to do? Right. But at the end of the day, our dollar is you know, a dollar physically is worth nothing. It's literally worthless. Um, it's worth the cost of the paper or whatever it is or ones and zeros. Um, and the reason it's worth something is because we trust that it's worth something. We trust in our government and as our government is either not keeping up with the people or the times and people are losing trust in their government, it is not infeasible that we start to put trust in our people. And if cryptocurrency, to your point, Ryan, is backed by people and the trust of people and this collective transparency of a, it's called a digital constitution, the way you're talking about how this works. It isn't infeasible to me that we put trust in this currency and we actually over time start to prefer this because of how its trust has built. That's what this is. Uh, this is money by the people for the people and it is a check and balance on the government. Um, central banks will have to level up their game, right? And that's a good thing for the people. 
that's a good thing for UBI and getting like money in the hands of the people. They have to compete with these non-sovereign currencies. So this is a technology of, of freedom. We think about like major technology buckets that are coming in our lifetime, right? Like artificial intelligence that like centralizes a whole bunch of things. Cryptocurrency decentralizes it. It gives power back to the individual and to the people. I like to say like, if you're, if you're scared of an open, permissionless, credibly neutral opt-in financial system, if that, if that strikes fear in your heart, maybe that says something about you, <laughs> right? Like, oh, wow. this is kind of like, this is completely opt-in. It's by definition optional. And we're building it from, from the ground up as a better system. So um, I hope nation states compete. I hope they do, because that will be better for the world, better for humanity. And by the way, crypto is not going to do everything that a nation can do ever. It can't build hospitals. It can't build roads. It can't provide health care. Uh, it can't you know, protect citizens. So I think that governments will come to the realization that this is actually a, a healthy relationship. And maybe we need a bit of separation of, of money and state in the way we separated in the way we separated religion and state. Um, this is a good thing for humanity. I love your optimism, Ryan. I sure as heck hope you're right. I, I look at the world around us. I look at how people in power will do virtually anything to stay in power. And I very much worry about what they'll do to either shut down some of these systems, these nascent systems, right, before they have the opportunity to fulfill their potential because the governments and, and people in power see them as threats because they don't understand them or alternatively will, and, and maybe I'm misunderstanding it because it's not possible for them to fully co-opt them, but will in some ways kind of co-opt these systems. So again, it's meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Relatedly and secondarily, I think, I think the promise of this is awesome and I want to participate and I'm going to read all the resources I can and I, I want to understand all of this better. Um, but I do think, you know, to the, to the point that we were sort of making earlier, I think you're, you're talking about geeks, you're talking about a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of white guys who are, who are sort of at the forefront of this, right? And that's not to put judgment on them or, or this, but, you know, it, it again, it's sort of meet the new boss, same as the old boss. And I, I, I really would love to see or, or understand how, as we are in the early stages of this, we can make it a more inclusive community so that the, the boats that are being lifted at the end of this um, look more like the world we want to see. And, and, and I think there's a real opportunity because of that. Um, I think that, you know, as we talk about equality in the, in the world, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that I think almost offers the most promise to me over so many other solutions that we maybe talk about. Um, so I think there's a lot of promise. And I think it also, the, the fear that gets struck in my heart is that the promise won't be fulfilled. Absolutely. Well, Carly, I, I, th I think you nailed it, right? Like you nailed the, the original meme of crypto, which is like the final boss is coming. Uh, you, you nailed sort of the, the bankless concern, which is let's not just replicate a new class of bankers. Let's actually create a more accessible money for the people. One thing I'll say on kind of the last point is I, I, I totally agree. We need more people from different communities involved in this movement. That's why part of it is uh, trying to make the knowledge here more accessible. That's part of definitely what we're doing at Bankless. One other thing I'll say though is, um, you know, I think the reality is it's not going to be optimally accessible right now in day one for every community. But the hope is that just like the internet, which was you know created in university campuses with with elites and all sorts of things, that the technology that they create then becomes a substrate for greater access and some social benefit for the rest of society once technology improves it to, to make the user experience better. So I know that there's kind of a limited set of like geeks and early adopters who are involved here, but I think that the, the credibly neutral substrate that they're building is going to be beneficial uh, to the world in the long run in the ways that the original internet was. So hopefully. I think it's awesome. I really do. I mean, I think that I think it's so interesting to think about these things, and and uh, and I love the promise that it that it sort of represents and what it could be for sure. Used to run a nonprofit and started um, called Suit Up, and it would do a lot of work in in kind of tougher communities here in New York, particularly. And if, I was like, if it doesn't work for those kids, if it doesn't work for their mom, many times a single mom raising raising the boys and girls that are that we're working with, if it doesn't work for her, it's probably not going to work. Um, and I think of the Fosse family when we worked in New Hampshire. It's not working for Jody Fosse, who's 
doing everything like does as her head down trying to put food on the table for her family is not going to work um so that that's the key right where we um we could have this amazing upside but if it's only working for the same people that the other system worked for we're toast i've said this i'm going to say this in the end of every episode is ryan we're going to have you back on this podcast in 10 years and you're <laughs> either going to say i told you so or i'm going to be like dude you are so wrong um <laughs> and i'll be fine well, let's ask, well ryan what what is the timeline do you have a sense of timeline because t- i point. remember so i i listened to a planet money episode about bitcoin probably 10 years back or so and they were making bets about like, you know, what was what was Bitcoin going to be in 10 years? And, you know, they probably were their bets weren't necessarily wrong. They were just the timeline wasn't right. What do you think the timeline is for for like cryptocurrency being call it like really mainstream or like everyday people using it? Do you have a, a prediction on that? 2020s. It's happening this decade. Absolutely. Oh, OK. You this think is where we go. There it is. Absolutely. Okay. 2020. So we'll by the end of this decade, we'll have at least a billion people using cryptocurrencies <gasps> in some form. Market cap will be into the trillions. So it'll be a globally significant. It's already in the trillions, but it'll be a globally significant monetary asset. I think it all goes down this decade. I think that this is like the first decade was, you know, building and figuring this stuff out, and the next decade is uh, is scaling it. So this is the bring, decade bring, of crypto. Okay. Yes, bring bring me on in ten years. We'll see if that turns out. But um, I'm I'm pretty excited about the future here. All right, Yang Gang, we are leading the decade of crypt- crypto. Um, this is not an investment recommendation podcast, and you should use your own money however you want. But I'm going to buy crypto. So you sold me, Ryan, <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, okay. um, I want stable coin. or stable coin or something. I don't know. I'll uh, let you. I'll keep everybody updated on this. But regardless. Um, Ryan, thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise. I learned a ton. Hopefully those of you listening did as well. Carly, thank you for balancing everyone um, and asking the right questions over and over. Um, This was a blast. Thank you for joining the future of money. Crypto plus the Yang Gang, baby. There you go.